why wouldn't we include this gold? <laughs> I've only ever been called silly nonsense uh, one time other in my life than this review. <laughs> this is so, I love this. Like sharing the one star reviews is so fun. Silly nonsense for teenagers. Too little helpful information. I don't know. What? what if you teenagers? are a teenager. <laughs> right. So, so we, we've got to dissect this in, in multiple angles. First of all, yeah, 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 yeah. silly nonsense for teenagers. Silly nonsense is not a word that many, or, or a phrase, many people would use. Correct. Yep. That, that, that got, me, got me right in the core, first of all. Yeah. But, but hold on, though. I don't disagree with it. Like, oh, it's absolute silly nonsense. Sometimes silly nonsense is a positive thing. Yeah, they like five. That could have been five stars. Silly nonsense. Silly nonsense. Yeah. Great. Yeah. Like, excellent. And then we've entirely misunderstood our market of security professionals uh, looking for a bit of downtime <laughs> by uh, by the silly nonsense for teenagers. If you are a teenager enjoying this podcast, let us know. Like I, I, I genuinely want to know. That sounds that would be neat. Maybe we should start using hip words and phrases. Oh, I'm with it. <laughs> My daughter tells me I'm I'm hip and with it all the time. Rue used the word vibe earlier. I yeah. did. Yeah, it was a whole vibe. He's vibing. That's lit, fam. <laughs> did you say it's lit, fam? Yeah, it felt wrong even saying no, it. Oh, I love it. Lean in. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so the second line was too little helpful information. With too much repetition and silliness. The silliness again, but too little helpful information. I think we should probably address that one at some point. All right, so we need more helpful information. That's that's actionable feedback. Fine, thank you. I don't understand the repetition. Like, it's too much repetition. Well, I what? mean, there's a data breach every week. Well, <laughs> we, we, can only... <laughs> we can't control that. Yeah, we can't. That's true. All right. And then silliness, but like, sure. And silliness. I mean, there's tons of silly nonsense that I watch on Netflix and enjoy. True. Yeah. True. I think if you're looking for a, a very sensible uh, way to, to take in the security news, this this might not be the right podcast for you. But but if it is and you do enjoy it and you do enjoy listening to us ramble around the news and discuss it, then please do rate us on iTunes and the other podcast places. Uh, not just, don't just rate us. Rate us five stars. Oh, like this is, yeah, a, we but, need those five star ratings. <laughs> you do at the same time have to tell us whether you're a teenager or not. Yep. Because that, that will just help with our, with our demographics as well. And whether or not you like silly nonsense. In fact, if we were flooded with five star reviews whose title was Silly Nonsense for Teenagers, I would be so happy. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, no, don't do that. That might actually impact the brand. That might actually harm our discovery, right? <laughs> but don't but if that. you wanted to put a phrase alongside that was similar to silly nonsense, random banter or, or some yep. such, yep. then please go for it. Delightful banter for security professionals. I like this uh, professional segue we've got going on yep. here. Yep. What would be the opposite of silly nonsense for teenagers? Like the opposite phrase. It would be... Intellectual genius. Yeah. Clever gibberish. Or, uh... No, no, no. Balderdash. I've always liked Balderdash. That would be pretty good. Balderdash for utes. <laughs> Hang on. Let's see. I think we've uh, drawn this out far too long. <laughs> I, I can just see Rue in the shared document adding <laughs> potential titles for people's reviews. I, I like it. Rational sense for octogenarians. Like, let's go. <laughs> <laughs> All right, should we jump into some Watchtower Weekly? Let's do it. My mouth isn't working very well today. Would you Would you like me to take this one? Uh, so, I mean, you can feel free to take this one if you like. Uh, T-Mobile has been hacked again. Uh, 37 million customers' data stolen. This one comes from friend of the show, Graham Cluley. Uh, the wireless network operator T-Mobile has suffered yet another data breach. According to a notice filed with the U.S. Securities and Exchange Commission, the SEC, T-Mobile discovered on the 5th of January 2023 that hackers had exploited a weakness in the company's API to steal data. T-Mobile's preliminary investigation has found that the details of approximately 37 million current post-paid and pre-paid customer accounts have been stolen by hackers. 
although the API did not grant access to customer social security numbers, passwords, payment card details, and other financial account information, it turns out that a large number of customers have had the following details exposed. Their name, their billing address, their email, phone numbers, T-Mobile account numbers, and information such as the number of lines on the account and plan features. Yeesh. That's plenty for a phishing attack. That's plenty for a, a social engineering attack against T-Mobile even. Yeah, I was going to say, someone rings you up? Yeah. Mm. According to T-Mobile, the attackers first exploited the impacted API around the 25th of November in 2022, meaning they could have been gathering data for over a month before their unauthorized access was noticed. T-Mobile says it is informing affected customers about the data breach and has notified federal authorities and law enforcement. As we all know, this is not the first time T-Mobile have had a data breach. Just the ones we know about that we can recall are the August 2021 data breach, the one back in January 2021, another in March of 2020, again in November of 2019, and then again in August of 2018. Uh, Perhaps all made worse by the fact that T-Mobile in 2021, quote, commenced a substantial multi-year investment working with leading external cybersecurity experts to enhance its cybersecurity capabilities and transform its approach to cybersecurity Boy, if they just tried a little harder, they could have gotten the word cybersecurity in there a fourth time. Yeah, maybe maybe we just haven't realized uh, the fruits of their labor yet. You know, it's it's fine. That's only, it's only been two years. So, yeah, uh, the company says that it has, quote, made substantial progress to date and protecting its customers data remains a top priority. Look at that. That's the gold phrase, ladies and gentlemen. Uh <laughs> Our ding, ding, customers' ding, ding. data yeah, is, is a top priority. We also found a rather hilarious photo at T-Mobile's store at Times Square, where it's a big sign that says, your safety is our priority. It's just delightful. I mean, I love this photo. Yeah. Where did that money go? <laughs> did they, is it just a marketing campaign, do you think? Do they, did they literally just spend it on, on adverts that say your data your is... Your safety <laughs> is our priority. Yeah. And put it up in Times Square. That's got to cost a hefty amount. Oh, dear. They're all wearing masks in the photo, though, so at least they're being COVID safe. It's true. Yeah, this is this is one, one data breach too many, I think. It truly is. Where's Dido Harding when you need her? <laughs> Was she was she T-Mobile? She was, yeah. At least through several of these past data breaches. Mm. Have we had her on the show? <laughs> no. Um, <laughs> I would not like to give a platform to Dido Harding. Okay. All right, let's move on to something a little bit more uh, interesting and fun. This one comes from popularmechanics.com. Scientists can now use Wi-Fi to see through people's walls. It isn't immediately clear how using only a Wi-Fi signal to track human movement through walls improves personal privacy, but that's what a new study from Carnegie Mellon University claims. In a recently published paper, the researchers expanded on the study of employing Wi-Fi signals to map human movement, especially in low-light situations that make using other technologies less than desirable. They write, quote, We developed a deep neural network that maps the phase and amplitude of Wi-Fi signals to UV coordinates within 24 human regions. The results of the study reveal that our model can estimate the dense pose of multiple subjects with comparable performance to image-based approaches by utilizing Wi-Fi signals as the only input. This pathway opens the options for low-cost, broadly accessible human tracking through walls. High-cost technology has successfully mapped people's movements through walls for years, and researchers at the Massachusetts Institute of Technology have spent over a decade working on ways to more easily see people through walls, whether using cell phone signals or Wi-Fi. In the Carnegie Mellon study, scientists have had Wi-Fi signals send and receive a body's coordinates and then use dense pose to map the body. From the study, quote, advances in computer vision and machine learning techniques have led to significant development in 2D and 3D human pose estimation from RGB cameras, LIDAR, and radars. However, human pose estimation from images is adversely affected by occlusion and lighting, which are common in many scenarios of interest. By reducing the need for advanced and expensive technology, the Carnegie Mellon researchers say they can make human tracking more available. Somehow, they've also positioned the breakthrough as a privacy-positive situation. I, I'm having a hard time thinking of an application for this that isn't, like, military. So can someone help me out here? Oh, yeah. I didn't think about that. This sounds like something you'd see in, like, a Mission Impossible movie. I don't get this at all. The description of the paper says that this paves the way for a low-cost, broadly accessible, privacy-preserving algorithm for human sensing. But I think the very act of human sensing is privacy-invasive, no? Mm. So, like, they might be doing a privacy-invasive thing in a privacy-preserving, algorithmic way, but 
looking at people through walls is still super weird. Yeah. Have you clicked through to the article? Yeah. The picture at the top of the article is really something. Wow. Yeah, that's creepy. The article even posits, like, it is not immediately clear how how using a Wi-Fi signal to track human movement through walls improves personal privacy. There's got to be something we're missing here. I think essentially, like, they're saying that people are already using things like radar and LIDAR in public places to do human sensing. I, I, the term human sensing is awful. I guess there's been, like, heat mapping, censoring for years, yeah. Yeah, so all of these ways, RGB cameras, LIDAR, radar, all of these things are being used anyway and being placed in public places, and that raises significant privacy concerns. This would apparently do it in a privacy-preserving way because you are sensing the human without being able to identify features, I guess. But it's quite an odd one, right? Can we just get Tim Newcomb, the author of this Popular Mechanics article, on the phone for a minute so he can tell us about this? Maybe he's, <laughs> maybe he's got some ideas. <laughs> All right, the next one comes to us from TechCrunch.com. U.S. announces it seized Hive ransomware gang's leak sites and decryption keys. The infrastructure behind Hive, one of the most prolific ransomware operations, has been seized by law enforcement agencies in the United States and Europe. Hive says its dark web portal seized as part of the coordinated law enforcement action carried out by the U.S. Department of Justice, the FBI, Secret Service, and several European government agencies just months after the federal government's cybersecurity unit, CISA, sounded the alarm about Hive's ongoing extortion efforts. The FBI confirmed Thursday that it had access to Hive's computer network since July of 2022, allowing federal agents to capture and offer Hive's decryption keys to victims worldwide. Since its takeover, the FBI has helped at least 336 victims of the Hive ransomware, according to the affidavit, preventing more than $130 million in ransom payments, said U.S. Attorney General Merrick Garland during a press conference. According to the government, the FBI also successfully disrupted a Hive ransomware attack on a Louisiana hospital, saving the victim from a $3 million ransom payment and another attack targeting a school based in Texas. Hive, which operates a ransomware-as-a-service model, previously targeted a wide range of industries and critical infrastructure with a particular focus on healthcare and public health entities. The gang claimed Illinois-based Memorial Health System as its first healthcare victim in August of 2021, followed by Costa Rica's Public Health Service and New York-based emergency response and ambulance service provider Empress EMS. Hive also targeted Tata Power, a top power generation company in India, in October. Garland added that the FBI has also begun dismantling Hive's front and back-end infrastructure in the U.S. and abroad, which included the seizure of two of Hive's back-end servers located in Los Angeles. The FBI did not say how it identified the Hive servers, and no arrests or indictments were announced during the press conference. This is cool. We recently discussed that for many of these ransomware attacks, that law enforcement does not get involved, and it's been on on sort of this... uh, citizen brigade to to help people here this is heartening to hear that 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 there's been a more coordinated effort to sort of cut this off at the knees feels nice to finally have some good news around ransomware yeah as of late isn't it yeah absolutely i think doing it in a way as well that that doesn't fuel the insurance side of it you know when people take out ransomware insurance and then the insurance literally just you know immediately pays out that's always a difficult way to look at it because you're kind of fueling the the insurance industry as well as the ransomware industry. There was actually a recent BBC article about how people are paying less ransoms now, which is an ongoing trend that there are less payouts being made, which I also feel is good news when it comes to ransomware. Yes, absolutely. All right, the last one comes to us today from the New York Times, which posits, everyone wants your email address. Think twice before sharing it. When you browse the web, an increasing number of sites and apps are asking for your email address. It may seem harmless, but when you enter your email, you're sharing a lot more than just that. For decades, the digital advertising industry relied on invisible trackers planted inside websites and apps to follow our activities and then serve us targeted ads. There have been sweeping changes to this system in the past few years, including Apple's release of a software feature in 2021, allowing iPhone users to block apps from tracking them, and Google's decision to prevent websites from using cookies, which follow people's activities across sites in its Chrome browser by 2024. Advertisers now try to track people through other means, and one simple method is by asking for their email address. One technology that is gaining traction is an advertising framework called Unified ID 2.0, or UID 2.0, which was developed by the Trade Desk, an ad technology company. Say, for example, you are shopping on a sneaker website using UID 2.0 and a pop-up asks you to share your email address and agree to receive relevant advertising. 
Once you enter your email, UID 2.0 transforms it into a token composed of a string of digits and characters. That token travels with your email address when you use it to log into a sports streaming app on your TV that also uses UID 2.0. Advertisers can link the two accounts together based on the token, and then they can target you with sneaker ads on the sports streaming app because they know you visited the sneaker website. Since your email address is not revealed to the advertiser, UID 2.0 may be seen as a step up for consumers from traditional cookie-based tracking, which gives advertisers access to your detailed browsing history and personal information. However, Mozilla, the nonprofit that makes the Firefox web browser, called UID 2.0 a regression in privacy because it enabled the type of tracking behavior that modern web browsers were designed to prevent. There are simpler ways for websites and apps to track your web activity through your email address. An email could contain your first and last name, and assuming you've used it for some time, data brokers have already compiled a comprehensive profile on your interests based on your browsing activity. A website or an app can upload your email address to an ad broker's database to match your identity with a profile containing enough insights to serve you targeted ads. So if you are wondering why you are continuing to see relevant ads despite the rise of privacy tools that combat digital tracking, it's likely because you are still sharing your email address. The, the interesting thing is, like, are they talking about when you sign up for a service with a username and password or are they talking about like when they ask for your email to email you stuff like a newsletter or save 20 percent on this website with your email address yes i don't know i i kind of think this was probably happening before i don't see this as some sort of like revolutionary thing i'm kind of assuming that a lot of advertisers are sharing account information for advertising as well. Maybe my optimism wanes there. No, I think that you're probably right. But it's also, this this may now be one of the higher nails that's sticking up out of the board, mm. given the fact that we've had improvements elsewhere. I also wonder whether with the privacy changes, a lot of privacy policies that did used to say, yeah, we'll give your email address to like literally our entire advertising network. I, I wonder whether people are less likely to click that so that by tokenizing it, they're able to say that they're not sharing your your actual email address with those companies so that it doesn't have to go in a privacy policy because they're just like literally tokenizing the, the email address and kind of sharing the, the token itself. Yeah. It seems like a bit of a get out of jail free card type of thing. It is just sort of the next step in the cat and mouse game that is preventing companies from tracking us. Yeah. The interesting kind of downside of this as well is the other website that is looking to track you, you also need to put your email address in that website, (laughs) right? So you have to kind of, you are the one that has to connect it up both sides. If you really don't trust a service, by not putting your email address in there or even by putting a, a fake email address in there, you are disconnecting that entire web. So like I, I kind of think like, this isn't as big of a problem as things like cookies and things like invisible trackers that you can't stop because at any point you can stop doing that. I don't generate a whole bunch of email addresses at the moment. I have like a few and and I move from one to the other, but I, I don't like have a whole bunch that I use for individual services. So I'd be, I'd be got by this pretty badly. I think I need a, an online shopping email address at least. There are some tools that can help here. Friends of 1Password Fastmail, they offer email generation. So you can actually generate a unique email address each time. Uh, So if you wanted to use something like that, you could. That would prevent this type of widespread profile building based on your email address. You can also shut those addresses down after after a period of time if you don't want to get email to them anymore. Apple has also introduced tools for creating unique email addresses, as has Mozilla. When possible, though, like just... Don't. Don't put your email address in here. (laughs) Don't do that. (laughs) Joining me on the show today is George Finney. George has worked in cybersecurity for over 20 years and been recognized as one of the top 100 CISOs in the world by CISOs Connect. If that wasn't enough, he is also a speaker, professor, podcast host, and best-selling author of several cybersecurity books and is here today to talk about his latest book, Project Zero Trust, a t-shirt he is also wearing, a story about a strategy for aligning security and the business. George, welcome to the show. How are you? Oh, I'm doing great. Thank you so much, Michael. This is awesome to be here. Yeah, I'm, I'm excited. How's the release of the new book been? I was prepared for it to be kind of a big deal, but man, I'm just not prepared for the amount of support people are given from the community. Like 
it's kind of going viral, which is amazing. This is my fifth cybersecurity book. So I felt like I've been through the process, but it's selling a hundred times any of my other books. And for good reason. I mean, I, I think Zero Trust is, is just one of the most important things in our community right now. So people yeah. are, are, are taking advantage. That's that's awesome. Congratulations. That's very, very cool. How how great. It's a, it's a good problem to have. Yeah, for sure. I wasn't sure where you were going when you're like, well, yeah, I got to tell you, it's it's been a little different this time. And I was like, oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So can you give our listeners a little bit of background on yourself and talk about why you decided to write this book? So, you know, I, I kind of actually thought I was out. Like I, I, my last book, Well Aware, it won the Book of the Year Award back in 2020. That was my opus, my passion project. And I thought, okay, you know, I'm going to go do some other stuff now. So actually, my publisher, Wiley, called me out of the blue a year ago. And they said, hey, you want to write a book on Zero Trust? And, you know, my initial re- reaction was, man, I, you know, I, I'm, I'm kind of done writing books. Have you talked to the guy that invented Zero Trust, John Kindervog? You know, I know him. Like, I can just do, set up an intro for you guys. Like, it, it's totally cool. And they're like, yeah, we... We've been trying to get a hold of him for a few months. You know, he's just too busy. So, of course, texted him like, John, what are you doing? I thought you were going to write a book on Zero Trust. You've been talking about this for years. And, you know, he's like, yeah, man, I'm, I'm too busy, but you can do it and I'll give you all my notes. So I'm like, holy cow, to get to work with John on a, on a project. It was weird. There was this moment over the weekend where the idea for the book just like crystallized. I just knew I had the picture, sat down and worked with him for several weeks talking about ideas and what kind of uh, you know approach to take and totally unexpected. But I, I've always heard of like musicians where they say like, oh my gosh, this album just flowed out of me or, or like I did it all in in like one take or one sitting. And that's the way this book was, man. I mean, you know, again, very different from my other experiences. I've never heard of another book coming together so quickly. And it, it was just a, just an amazing, fun project to do. That's really cool. Yeah, that's awesome. How fun to just like get hit by the muse in that way and just like churn something out. That's great. All right. So the book, it comes in the form of a fictional story following Dylan, a new IT director at a company that experiences a ransomware attack on his first day. What led you to the narrative approach for this? And do you think that that's why this one is resonating so much with people? I think you're right. In the beginning, the publisher said, well, well, who do you think the audience is for a book on Zero Trust? You know, my answer was basically everyone in IT. If Zero Trust is just for the security nerds like, like, like me and you, I think we're going to fail. Right, because everybody has to play their role. Zero trust is kind of scary and you know confusing. There's there's a lot of marketing messages around it. Some security folks might take zero trust to mean cynicism, which is not what zero trust is about. Zero trust isn't about not trusting people. So putting readers into the the shoes of the people that have to go do zero trust, that's really resonating with people. And it's a story about a company that's breached, right? A lot of us are kind of living that, or we know someone who has. And so they, they respond by, by adopting zero trust and, you know, people rally around this cause of zero trust. And, we, you know, we show what it really means to remove the trust relationships from all different kinds of different systems, whether it's network or identity or cloud or physical security, right? You can do zero trust in all of these environments. And again, I think showing people rather than telling, right, that's, that's the way that authors write. I think putting that into practice is something that's actually kind of unique and you know kind of surprising yeah the story-based approach resonates quite a bit with me so it doesn't surprise me that that other people's other people feel the same way one of my favorite books that is written in this style is the anatomy of peace or the sequel leadership and self-deception it's all story-based and it takes what could be some very dry material and like actually makes it engaging and so i'm, I'm guessing that, that you're seeing a lot of that same type of reaction here that's very cool totally yeah Okay, so the book covers a five-step methodology for implementing zero trust and then four key zero trust design principles. Without going into too much detail, can you give a brief overview and and maybe tease out what what some of these are and why they're important? Yeah, so the four design principles, those are the things that John Kendervog kind of put forward when he initially created zero trust in his paper, No More Chewy Centers, back in 2010. Those haven't changed over the years. (laughs) And I think it's the number one thing. The first design principle is you got to start with the business. And I think there are a lot of other security frameworks or or what have you out there that they talk about architecture, starting with the business, aligning with the business's mission, understanding how the business makes money, 
talking to business leaders and having security be baked in from the CSO's perspective or your VPs of sales or development, all of those areas, focus on the business. That's the number one thing to start with zero trust. So the others are designed from the inside out, determine who or what needs access, these privilege kind of concepts. Those are the design principles. At a high level, if you want to know what zero trust is, we haven't, we haven't said what the definition of zero trust is. So <laughs> zero trust is a strategy uh, for uh, preventing or containing breaches by removing the trust relationships we have in digital systems. So because there's no one size fits all solution for every different kind of organization, you have to have a tailored approach. So five steps, define your protect surface, map your transaction flows. Then, so finally, the next step is architecting your environment, but you've done all of those other things first, and then create your, your zero trust policies and then monitor and maintain and have that feedback loop to, to, uh, to iterate uh, and to keep improving, right? So big picture, oh my gosh, there, there, there's so much there. And, you know, again, nine steps, that's a lot of steps, uh, but, you know, each chapter it focuses on a different protect surface, if you will, whether it's identity or physical security. But each chapter also kind of illustrates one of these concepts. And so, again, you're walking through that process. Again, if you have a repeatable process and a methodology for, for success when it comes to security, everybody's on the same page. You're following your process. I think it makes the whole thing easier because everybody is working together towards that common goal rather than kind of going off in different directions, kind of taking riffing and doing their own thing. Yeah, uh, that's that's really cool. I like that. Okay, I hear that you have created a cybersecurity personality test. What is a cybersecurity personality test? <laughs> I need to hear a little bit more about this. So if you read Stephen Covey's Seven Habits, I wanted to write something similar for cybersecurity. And by the way, I think there are nine different cybersecurity habits. The book Well Aware... Um, it tells the stories of successful business leaders or other security leaders who kind of embody the, those different nine cybersecurity habits. But, you know, I, I kept hearing from people, George, okay, cool, nine habits. Uh, where do I start? How do I implement these in, in my daily life? So my answer is, okay, take the personality test. It'll help you identify your primary internal cybersecurity strength and primary external cybersecurity strength, right? So there are things that you do when you're on your own, all alone, those things like, you know, not writing your password down. Okay, cool. Those are your internal habits. The external habits are, are, are things you do when you're working with other people. So big picture, everyone's got their own strengths. We can't expect everyone to be perfect at everything. Instead, I think we need to assemble a team that has you know, representative of, of all the different strengths. The analogy I use is, you know, so habits, I, I did a lot of research into psychology and neuroscience for the book. And it turns out that habits work like a muscle. They can get tired, but they can also get stronger. You can measure how much stronger they're getting. But if they work like muscle groups, right, some people might naturally be more like an endurance runner. Other people might be more like a power lifter or, you know, a basketball player or, you know, sprinter, right? So if we're coaching people to improve their cybersecurity, we can't just, you know, say, be perfect. Here's the perfect bulletproof advice that one size fits all that isn't customized to you in the way you live your life. Instead, I want you to start with your strengths. So find your strengths and then start there. You use the low hanging fruit to kind of build momentum in order to get to doing the harder, more difficult things later on. So we've built a company around this. This is my side hustle after I re writing books, right? But I've built some training. It's like a supplement to your normal security awareness training, but it's all about changing behaviors. And that's really the outcome that we're after when it comes to security awareness. And, you know, the personality test is free. Anybody can take it. But again, it's, it's just giving you another tool in your toolkit. Uh, just like, you know, people give you the advice if you want to start working out, go to sleep in your workout clothes and, and, and have your shoes ready by the bed. We're going to make it easy. And I think that's what, you know, using security as a habit really does for, for, for you. Yeah. I'd never heard that that sort of concept of that, like habits are like muscles and you can, you know, they can get tired, but they can also get stronger and that you can measure it. I think that's fascinating to hear. Oh, oh man, it's crazy. I read this psychology study where the researchers kind of copied this traditional study that people had done, but they flipped it and they made the psychologist be rude to the individuals that were taking the test. <laughs> and oh my gosh, the people that the psychologists were rude to, they had these habits, but they weren't able to kind of do as well as they had done in previous tests. But think about it from a cybersecurity perspective. If your boss has been yelling at you all day, um, you know, which uh, gosh, happens more than you would think, 
it really it, it has an impact on other things. And I think that's that's one of the reasons why culture is so incredibly important to security. It's such an important topic right now. And, and people are at the center of that. You know, I kind of take some of those lessons that are that are human centric and translate them to, to Project Zero Trust. OK, second to last question today. In your opinion, what are some of the biggest challenges facing chief information security officers today? Oh, oh my gosh. I mean, the, 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 there's so many. <laughs> <laughs> uh, you know, I, I think, that, you know, one of the, the biggest challenges for us is technology is evolving so quickly. Security is always kind of on that bleeding edge to secure the next big thing. So today, gosh, we're, we're talking about supply chain issues or we're talking about Kubernetes and containers, whereas you know, just two years ago or three years ago, we were talking about VMs and snapshots, right? You know, so um, that kind of shift, it's it's really difficult to keep up. Maybe some some technology fatigue going on. How many systems can I expect one person to, to, to manage different systems, right? So is it, you know, two or three? Is it 10 or, or, or 20? I, I think there's a limit on what we can expect your average IT analyst or architect or whatever to understand. And the way that we get there, we've got to have massive amounts of education to keep people up to date with their skills. That's really the challenge when we talk about, you know, this workforce shortage that we have. All the things that you have to know, you either you need to know everything or you need to know, you know, something really deep and you kind of specialize in that area. But yeah, it's not like it was 20 years ago where, you know, everybody in security was already a generalist. You know, there's a lot more specialization now. And I think that's part of what's driving the talent shortage. And I think my answer to that has been, I just double down or triple down on making sure I train not just my employees, but everyone in IT. If we're just relying on security to, to secure the enterprise, we're not going to be successful. Everyone in IT has to feel like they, they understand and, and are committed to, to delivering that in all of their respective roles. I love the the angle of security and the, the almost daily changes in the industry now and how, how much sprawl there is in, in all of these new things that are always coming up that you have to learn and stay on top of and, and, and things of that nature. It's It can be definitely very overwhelming. Okay. Last and potentially most important question, uh, where can people go to find out more about you and how can they get the book? So uh, my, my website uh, comes from the last book. It's called wellawaresecurity.com. Head there. You can take the personality test. You can also, they've got links to go buy the books, obviously. But you can also go straight to Amazon and buy the book there. It's everywhere you like buying books. <laughs> also, I'm just going to shout out Audible. There is an audiobook for this. To my knowledge, it's the only book on Zero Trust that's, that's on Audible. And we got one of the actors from The Walking Dead to narrate the book. So Daniel Thomas May uh, is, is, is the actor. For me as a writer, to hear the characters like coming to life in his voice it was such an awesome experience. I, 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 was, I was totally blown away. Ah, that's really cool. But yeah, ch check out the book. I'm available on uh, LinkedIn. And yeah, feel free to, to check it out and let me know what, what you think. Very cool. Well, listen, George, thank you so much for the time today. This was an absolute pleasure and take care. Thank you. Okay, so are we ready for rapid fire security questions? Quite, quite ready. Quite Very ready. much so. This is the game where we rapidly fire security questions at each other to achieve some hopefully random but memorable wrong answers. And we get 60 seconds on the clock. So who's going to go first this week? All right, I'll go first. All right, Matt, here we go. One minute. Oh, okay. What was your first job? I was a meerkat in the zoo. What's the next big toy craze? Uh, it's a uh, chicken. What song do you sing in the shower? Uh, I... A, a cherries a berry the the rap edition <laughs> <laughs> who will win next year's eurovision uh we will of course oh optimistic which phone app do you use the most um the beer app that looks like a beer and then you can tilt it in either direction <laughs> <laughs> do you remember that it was a good bit i was gonna say i don't take you for a beer drinker what high school did you attend uh m m money school What's the name of the next big Harry Styles song? Um, uh, o o oranges, aren't they cool? <laughs> How many bones have you broken? Uh, four. Oh, time is up. Uh, I can't wait for the release of oranges, aren't they cool? 
<laughs> oranges. Didn't he have a song that was water? Was it Watermelon Sugar? Was that Harry Styles? He loves fruit. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Oranges aren't the cool. He loves fruit, that man. I love it. I also, I didn't go to money school. Uh, there was just an advert for a credit broker in front of me while I was <laughs> while I was reading that. And I was like, my, my brain cannot think of anything else. Okay, Rue, are you ready? I am so ready. One minute starting now. Who's your favourite character from Lord of the Rings? Hmm? Oh, um, the Hulk. What was your hair colour as a child? My hair? Actually, I came out bright blue. <laughs> what was your high school mascot and what was it called? My high school mascot uh, was the Santa Cruz Land Cruisers. What was it called? The land, it, it was Larry the Land Cruiser. I'm sorry, sorry. What's your favorite type of vacation? Oh, uh, Antarctica. Who is your favorite artist? Uh, it would be, hold on, god damn it, uh, Boba Fett. What's the last landmark you visited? Uh, uh, the Toilet Memorial in um, downtown Tallahassee. And what's your favorite reality TV show? <laughs> Hold on. I, I realize it's my last one. So just... Time's up, but I'll give you that one. No, 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 no. Yeah. Hang on. Wait, wait. Hang on. Uh, I need to come up with something with some alliteration. Uh, ro- robots or toddlers? <laughs> I like it. Hang on. Versus or or? Yes. No, versus. Sorry. Yeah, robots versus toddlers. Yeah. Oh, okay. I feel like Matt would watch that show. Oh, absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> Well, you both kind of drew again. Yeah, I mean, there's not really a winner or a loser. The, the, in this one. Yeah, I don't, I don't think so. I think it's more the panic. The the panic wins. Yeah, the sheer panic. Yeah. But when you <laughs> allow Rue to think of robots versus toddlers or whatever it was for for almost a minute and a half, I think that the panic <laughs> isn't quite there of an no, instant answer. I provided that answer instantly, as I think the editing will show. <laughs> I like imagining yeah. that you had blue hair as a child. I like imagining that you had hair as a child. <laughs> <laughs> wow all right that's fine that's fair end on a ruben <laughs> all right well i hope you've enjoyed this episode of uh rue with a couple minutes of, of mad nana today the rue special <laughs> well i love you guys i oh, love you too love you both Bye-bye. bye bye